Clark County District Attorney Steve Wolfson joining us now to talk about uh, a run for re-election. Steve, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you, John. Thanks for having me on your show. All right, well, let's just start pure and simple with why you're running for re-election. Well, John, you know, we're at a critical stage here in Clark County. Uh, COVID hit us all pretty hard. Uh, we lost people to COVID. A lot of people got sick and it affected the justice system as well, uh, pretty, pretty intensely. So we're at a critical stage. We need a strong experience and leadership. I think I have that and I'm willing to work for the people for another four years. Let's talk a little bit about that experience in your time as, as DA so far. Uh, one of your pitches your, uh, that you've highlighted during your time there, smart reform programs, diversion programs, explore a little bit what the programs are and how they have, uh, have they worked as they've been put into the uh, justice system. Well, what we've learned over the years is we have to be a little smarter about how we do business in the criminal justice system. Uh, so we've started redefining and refocusing our priorities. And one of the things we've created is a, a program called Project Redirect. It is a diversionary program. It's the first of its kind in Nevada. We realize that most cases never go to trial and most cases involving low-level nonviolent offenders get resolved in a plea bargain. They get misdemeanors or sometimes even dismissals. Uh, but we want to offer certain treatment programs to these people. If uh, there are victims and restitution is owed, we want to collect that restitution. So we created Project Redirect, which diverts people out of the system assuming they comply with a program of treatment, assuming they pay restitution if appropriate, assuming they stay out of trouble. And again, these are for low-level nonviolent offenders. So what it does is it helps the system. It saves money. We're not charging people. We divert them from the charging decision to give them a chance to get whatever treatment they need, uh, pay the restitution, uh, and, and have a little informal probation to earn this diversion. It's the smarter way of doing business. So if, if that, those programs are sort of freeing up the system a little bit or, or at least lessening uh, the burden on, on uh, going to trial and so forth, uh, is there an effort then to try to re-channel some of those resources to the prosecutor's office? You've talked about a big backlog of murder cases right yeah. now in the DA's office, about 450. So how, if you're reelected, will you try and address that backlog to try and get justice for murder cases, which is obviously a high priority. Yeah. Well, we've already started, John, on a number of things. Um, by diverting some of the low-level nonviolent cases, we're able to refocus on what people care about the most, which is public safety. Uh, people want to feel safe uh, when they're in their homes and when they're going to the supermarket, so we're refocusing our efforts on the violent crime. Uh, the cases involving uh, homicides, the cases involving guns, things like that, because that's what people care about most. You know, we've seen an increase in that kind of crime uh, through the pandemic. We saw a big effort by Metro Police to try and address that on the Las Vegas trip. We've seen some really uh, tragic cases, murder cases in the last year or so. Uh, what, from a prosecutorial standpoint, uh, can your office do and can you do to, on a penalty standpoint, point, deter similar crimes moving forward or at least find, try and get those cases to trial? Well, John, you have to realize, as, as most of our viewers should realize, that very, very few cases actually get to trial. We only do about 125 to 150 jury trials a year, and that's after filing 25 to 30,000 felony cases. So 99.9% .9 of cases are settled with a plea deal. Uh, but what we're focusing on is what people care about the most, which is uh, the serious crimes. Uh, yes, we have a backlog of murder cases. It's a serious problem. We have about 450, 450 pending murder cases. Now, we cut into that number pre-COVID. We got it down to uh, about 350, but COVID had a drastic effect on all of us. Uh, our homicide rate is up 50% the first six months of this year compared to last year. So we've created a new program. We have a new homicide team with our judges. It's actually not that new, it's about three years old. But what we've done is we've selected four of our most experienced judges to hear the murder cases. So we can focus on getting those cases resolved. We've also created a new rule for settlement conferences. Most cases settle, but we need to bring the parties together so they can talk settlement. So we've come up with some new ways of doing things. 
sort of in line with the discussion of, of prosecuting uh, our murder cases, uh, let's talk about the death penalty. Um, your critics on the left, your opponent, uh, they are critical of your standpoint on the, mm -hmm. on the death penalty and your, uh, your view. Do, do you have any leeway or any movement in your point of view on the death penalty? Do you think there should be some changes? Obviously it was discussed up in Carson City. Are you willing to discuss possibly adjusting your use of the death penalty in, the, in, in uh, prosecutions? Well, yes, absolutely, and I have so? engaged in those discussions, and I continue to engage in those discussions, but a little history is appropriate. Uh, my predecessor filed uh, almost 20 death penalty cases a year uh, before I took office. Uh, my first six, seven years, I reduced that number to under 10. So I cut the number of death penalty cases in half. And in the last two or three years, I've only filed a handful. Because I recognize uh, the state of Nevada has not executed anybody uh, since 2006. And just a couple of years ago, when a very violent person who was convicted of a couple of homicides, where the jury uh, created, not created, but invoked the death penalty, and he wanted to be executed, and we still couldn't execute Mr. Dozer, and he ended up committed, committing suicide in prison. Um, I recognize that it is a controversial issue, but I also recognize that the state of Nevada is pretty split on whether we should keep the death penalty or abolish it. Uh, the polls I've been made aware of have it at about 50-50. So as the chief law enforcement officer, it's my job to enforce the law. And while the death penalty is still on the books, uh, in those very select cases involving multiple homicides, uh, one October is a perfect example. That killer got away too easy. Okay, he killed 60 people and then shot and killed himself. In my opinion, he got off too easy. But if that man had survived, that's the kind of case we should have the death penalty for or other similar cases that are so egregious. But I fully recognize that they cost a lot of money, death penalty cases, so we're continuing to have discussions. I've even suggested perhaps a referendum. Let's educate Nevadans on both sides of the issue so that Nevadans can speak up and voice their opinion. Why keep it? Why keep it? The death penalty. Why, why continue to, in certain circumstances, as you mentioned, keep the death penalty on the table? Um, because there are those certain circumstances where uh, a vast majority of people feel the death penalty is appropriate. Okay. And you're, you're, you're still one of them? I'm one of them in the extreme cases, yes. Okay. But I uh, fully recognize that many homicide cases don't fall into that extreme category. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit here, talk about um, some cases uh, involving police reform. Um, you recently started a third grand jury. There has been some uh, questions raised about why grand juries have been called in certain cases. I'm thinking of the uh, Officer Kenneth LaPera case. Uh, there's a couple other ones as well, the Byron Williams, Jorge Gomez cases. Wh educate the viewers, if you can, why you called grand juries in those cases and if you think that was the appropriate method of trying to find resolution? Well, let's talk about grand juries in general. Um, we do have three grand juries. We've had three grand juries now for a couple of years. Uh, grand juries serve a very important purpose. There are some cases which should be taken to the grand jury. Uh, cases involving uh, children, uh, where children are obviously scared, frightened of their accuser, and by taking a case before the grand jury, we can present children uh, to the grand jury and we can expedite the prosecution of those cases. Uh, there are some cases that have special needs that we take to a grand jury. There are some cases that we want to get into the trial court as quickly as possible. There's a lot of serious cases, John. A lot of cases involving homicides, a lot of cases involving sexual assault, and a lot of cases that are high profile, that we want to move through the system as quickly as possible. So I can talk about the individual cases you mentioned. Uh, the LaPera case, that was the officer. Um, we took that case to the grand jury because we wanted to see if we could move it into district court. But that grand jury failed to find probable cause. So that's 
a, a body of citizens that listened to the evidence and said, we don't think there's enough evidence to proceed. How would you characterize the effort by prosecutors in that case to actually prosecute Officer LaPera? I had some of my best prosecutors uh, working that case. Uh, but the officer had good lawyers themselves. Uh, these lawyers presented us with another side to the story. We are required by law to present uh, what is called exculpatory evidence uh, to the grand jury. That's evidence that tends to negate guilt. We are required by law to present that, which is what we did. So after a full uh, investigation and after a full presentation to the grand jury, that grand jury saw fit not to indict that officer. But at the grand jury, correct me if I'm wrong, it's only the prosecution that makes the presentation, correct? That's true. So then how, how would the defense also, attorneys have any input on how that grand jury makes its ultimate decision if the only ones they're hearing from is the prosecution? That's not true, though. Okay. Because the defense lawyers can present us with requests of certain evidence to present to the grand jury. And we are required by law to present exculpatory evidence evidence that tends to negate guilt. The defense lawyers presented us with that kind of evidence. We were required to present it to the grand jury, which we did. So the grand jury heard a lot of evidence and in their infinite wisdom decided not to file an indictment. And, and we bring this up because there's been a lot of discussion, as you know, nationwide and here in Las Vegas mm -hmm. about uh, accountability for law enforcement. Not that there are cases, there's only been a very few, where an officer is charged with a crime. So, Well, you, when know, that, you know, let me correct you there, because there's, well, there's a mistake there. We are currently prosecuting about 15 police officers right now. Okay. A lot of people don't realize that For we, use of force? Uh, for a number of things. Domestic battery. Right, I'm not drug talking. Drug offenses. About well, but uh, the accusation, which I think you're referring to, is that we don't charge police officers with crimes. We evaluate police officers and whether or not they committed crimes just like we do every other citizen. We have to determine whether a crime was committed and whether there's sufficient evidence to move forward. That's our ethical obligation. In some cases there's enough and in some cases there isn't. One of the accusations that's been made, uh, and it's kind of coming out in this race so far, is that you as, as DA uh, give sort of sweetheart deals to bigger name attorneys in, in Las Vegas, uh, David Chesnoff among others. Do you, what, what do you say to those accusations that when you're talking about settling cases before they even mm -hmm. get to trial, some of the high powered attorneys here in Las Vegas get um, the benefit of the DA's office? Yeah, I wonder um, what those muckrackers, which uh, Mr. John Ralston referred to them as, uh, whether or not they did enough research uh, because it's my understanding that Mr. Chesnoff has challenged those accusations. I challenge those accusations as well. Um, there was an individual uh, represented by Mr. Chesnoff uh, that was found guilty of a very serious felony DUI involving death and injury. Uh, ask that gentleman if he thinks that his lawyer got special treatment uh, because that gentleman is now serving a significant prison sentence. Uh, there's another case in the system right now involving a basketball player uh, where uh, a certain charge was dismissed uh, in a proceeding and we're still moving forward on that case notwithstanding who his lawyer is. So I take exception to the accusation that certain lawyers get special deals. We evaluate cases on a case-by-case -case basis, John, and we look at the strength or weakness, the merits of the case when we decide how to handle it. Kind of on that note about, uh, not those specific cases, but broadly, uh, when you previously ran for, for the position for, pro uh, for the prosecutor's office, you referenced the effort that you wanted to make to try and cut down on the high level of DUIs we see here in the Valley, yeah. uh, cutting down on gun crime. From the time you ran for uh, election before to now, do you think your office has taken enough steps to try and address those issues? I think we've taken a lot of uh, good steps. Uh, I have a DUI uh, specialty team that focuses on these DUI cases. Uh, a lot of people uh, neglect to follow the law and whether they consume alcohol, uh, legal drugs or illegal drugs uh, or whether they're speeding and driving recklessly or all of the above. Uh, we prosecute those cases vigorously. I am sorry to say 
that too many people are still uh, breaking the law and we're putting people in prison. But to answer your question, uh, there's always more you can do, um, whether it's education, whether it's public service announcements. I really think that we need to do more. Uh, we're a community here, John. I've been here 41 years. Uh, I uh, met my wife, I've raised a family here, I love Las Vegas. Uh, I don't like to see harm to come to people, but I think it's a community effort. I really think that the private sector needs to step up, perhaps pay for some more education, public service announcements, get the word out more that if you drive while impaired and you cause injury or death, you're going to go to prison. Crystal Ball, if you're reelected to uh, the district attorney's office, um, what does your office need in order to move forward? Well, like a lot of government uh, Besides, departments, yeah, resources. Funding, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we are um, a prosecutor's office that when you compare us to other prosecutors' offices in major metropolitan areas, uh, like Maricopa County or Los Angeles County, uh, I believe we don't have the same resources that other areas do. We do the best we can. I understand that everybody would like more resources, but I think what I said a few minutes ago, John, about reprioritizing and redefining uh, what is most important is a great step forward. We've been doing that for years, is a great step forward in meeting the needs of this community. What, what would you want to see, whether it's funding or, or staffing, whatever the case may be, where, would, where should those resources, in your opinion, be put moving forward? What would you like to add, enhance? Well, I think we need more police officers, okay? The police department, and I'm not gonna speak for the sheriff, but they're having um, some challenges with recruiting. Um, a lot of officers are retiring uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, my office, I can always use more prosecutors. I can always use more resources to focus on what's important most to people, which is the battle against violent crime. Okay. District Attorney Wolfson, appreciate you joining us. Thank you very Good much. Good question, we'll, we'll, Sean. We'll, Thank we'll you very much. We'll stay in touch during the election. Thanks for having me on your show.